But now let's go uh, and move back to the Conservatives. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Boris Johnson reshuffled his ministerial team and one of the people he sacked from government was the Transport Minister, Ms Ghani. Now, she hasn't spoken publicly since that sacking. Uh, she joins us now in the studio. Thanks very much for being with us this morning. Just talk us through what happened when the news was broken to you that you were sacked. Well, politics has no rhyme and reason and it's not like any other business job that you, 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 you do and the, the reshuffle was being covered on the news quite a bit and when I knew I was speaking to the Prime Minister quite early in the morning I, I think I knew that the gig was up um, and it's pro it sort of played out in public which is slightly different to any other uh, any other job that you can do. Um, so you knew the gig was up I guess when you called to his office in the House of Commons? No, no, it was, a, it was a telephone conversation, oh, a telephone yeah, conversation. but it was, it was quite early on um, in, in the morning so I had a feeling that um, maybe something was up. But look, you know, you are, you're, it's a huge privilege being a minister and it's absolutely right that the Prime Minister gets to choose who serves in government. Um, and I had a fantastic experience and I got very lucky with um, the portfolio that I got to, got to manage. But politics is very strange. Things move on very fast. So when the news breaks and um, your, your life is sort of, or your picture's on TV for a couple of hours, your phone is buzzing, but then the next thing happens and all of a sudden the um, story moves on quite quickly. How does that feel? Is it, are you relieved that the story's moved on or are you a bit sad that your phone's not going? Um, I was relieved that the story <laughs> moved on because uh, in the morning you're getting thousands of messages about what's going on and then later on you're getting thousands of messages about um, Sajid's um, resignation. But look, it's absolutely right that the Prime Minister gets to choose who, who serves in his government. So what did he say to you on the phone then? Well, you know, well, I talked about my work. I am pleased that um, the work that I did was recognised. I was very lucky that I was able to do some groundbreaking pieces of work um, within transport. We were able to put together the first public transport accessibility package, which means that we're the only country in the world that's aligned ourselves to the UN goals to ensure that all of our public transport system is accessible to people with disabilities. Did he, did he give you a reason when you spoke to him? The Prime Minister doesn't have to give a reason, and I think that is the way that it should be. So is that a no, then? There, was, there, there wasn't a reason, but look, I wasn't really expecting one, and nor does the Prime Minister have to give a reason either. Mm. Some people would say that, you know, you obviously were a high-profile backer of Jeremy Hunt during the leadership campaign. Do you think there's any truth in the feeling that some may have that this is a government that prizes loyalty above all else? Um, I think loyalty to the job, and I think if you do a, a stellar job, that uh, it's not that's just loyalty noted. to the job, is it? That we're talking about it's loyalty to the leadership, mm. to personalities, to characters. I think politics just moves on so fast. So that just seen as old history. Look, I did support Jeremy, and I thought it was important that Brexiteers like myself, who campaigned for Brexit, supported Jeremy. The party had been in a bind for quite a while, and it was important for a number of us to ensure that both candidates had backers from both from all spectrums of Brexit. I was also conflicted um, whilst the leadership campaign was going on. I was undertaking the delivery of a HS2 bill through the House and I didn't want to be conflicted while delivering that piece of legislation. But it it's really is old news. What's, what's great is that we've got a, a Prime Minister that's brought the party together and also brought the country together. We've got a, a fantastic majority and we're delivering a, a one-nation Conservative agenda. Sounds like you're angling for a return. <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I, it, it is a pleasure to be asked to, to serve in government, but um, I was only on the backbenches for a couple of years and I'm looking forward to cracking on with some of the campaigns that I set up then. One, one last question before we move on. Um, what did you do after you got the news? Uh, we saw the picture of Andrea Leadsom, you know, treating her team to a yeah. few bottles of wine, was it? Well, the peculiar thing is, you're, you're, you know, when, when, you, when you get the news, it's very fast and also you don't want to be in the way of the new ministers arriving, so you sort of pack up immediately and you, you leave quite quickly and at the same time you're saying goodbye to your, the staff in the department and you're trying to provide them with some leadership as well because they, they were getting a bit emotional when I was on, on the way out. Um, I was hoping that my phone was going to run out of battery because the messages were coming in so thick and fast and it obviously wasn't and um, I went home and we had um, curry for lunch. <laughs> um, just moving on to some of the other stories around today, um, Sir Philip Rutman, the most senior official in the Home Office, has quit, suing the government for constructive dismissal. In your experience, what's the government's relationship like with the civil service? Is there a problem there? Look, I, I, look for, in my experience within the Department of Transport, there were occasions when there were tensions because we are undertaking a fantastic agenda of delivering the people's priorities. And we had, as well as delivering within transport, we had the extra um, 
items of work to do around preparing for our new relationship with Europe so if as it's well. it's a fantastic agenda delivering on the people's priorities, why should there be any conflict with the civil service? We're working at a very, very progressive pace. So my experience of... Progressive Pritty means fast or...? Fast. Well, I'm, you know, my experience of working with Pretty is that she is incredibly determined. She provides strong leadership and she's delivering some very important aspects of our policy. The items that we promised at the election. We mustn't forget just recently that um, Priti Patel announced the points-based immigration um, system and also new funding for policing as well. These are two very important and heavy items of work that she has delivered. I do think it's curious that if you're providing leadership, if you're determined, working at a fantastic pace, that within men that is seen as a fantastic skill and for women sometimes it's seen as challenging. What, so you think some of the coverage has been a bit sexist? Of pretty I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, she's, she's doing a fantastic job. My constituents are pleased that we've delivered on what we promised on the points-based immigration and also that Pretty's delivered on, on policing reform too. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, you were a transport minister. Um, this week, a court ruled uh, that building a third runway at Heathrow would be illegal. The government said it was going to accept the decision, it wasn't going to challenge it. Now, of course, Boris Johnson famously said he was going to lie down in front of the bulldozers to stop it from happening. Do you think the government was quietly relieved? Well, I can't speak on behalf of, of government anymore. I'm no longer a minister, but I am very disappointed in the decision that was taken by the ruling. We are, you know, we are present, presenting ourselves as global Britain. Heathrow and all aviation um, is incredibly key to that, and I'm absolutely disappointed. If you look at the actual judgment, it um, dismissed the appeals on air quality and noise, but just focused on a component that maybe not all advice was taken to deal with our target for zero emissions. And I assume that could be because the advice was taken maybe before April 2019, when we were focused on reducing emissions by 80%, not by 100%. So it seems quite technical. Um, and Heathrow said that they would challenge the decision that was taken, um, and, and, and as they should. We, you know, 40% of our uh, a trade outside Europe goes through Do you think the government Heathrow. should challenge it? Look, they said it's a, a private enterprise, um, and Heathrow will take that going forward. I, I think that we can be compatible with our growth in infrastructure and dealing with our targets on zero emissions as well. I mean, you're clearly fully behind the idea of this third runway. I mean, I know that your special, speciality was kind of maritime when you were in the mm. Department for Transport, but just from your experience working there, did you get the sense that Boris Johnson was fully behind a third runway? Um, we, well, there wasn't, within the department, you just focus on what you need to, to deliver and we carried on delivering that. I mean, I was the HS2 minister and I took into account what all MPs a minister a thought. Sense, though, surely. But, I, but it's, look, we, I think what we need to do is ensure that we can make it compatible, that we can have a growth in aviation and manage our emissions too. If I just reflect on the work that I did in maritime, we had a huge challenge with the growth in maritime and I wanted to make sure that any decision we take in the UK didn't undermine the maritime sector in the UK. So we did two things. When I first became a minister in 2018, I worked with the International Maritime Organisation to deliver a global objective to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from all shipping. And then we had our own national strategy as well in the UK. Okay. So whether flights take off or into Heathrow, there are, you know, it doesn't really account to global yeah. emissions because they'll be taking place elsewhere. Every day a decision is delayed, we're losing business to another al airport okay. elsewhere. Uh, now, while we've got you, I'm keen to talk to you about what's happening in, in Afghanistan, something okay. I know that you've been following quite closely. Uh, the US and the Taliban signing that historic peace deal. Is this good news or should we be worried? Of course, <laughs> any way that we can deliver peace in Afghanistan is good news, but I am anxious about what this actually means. And signing a peace deal with the Taliban isn't signing a peace deal with the government of Afghanistan. We've already seen elections that take, took place last September, and there is tensions between um, President Ghani and Abdullah, Abdullah chief executive, who did and did not win that election, even though Ashraf Ghani won by 50%, 51% of the vote. The Taliban don't represent the government, and the Taliban most definitely do not represent all Afghan people. Within this deal, if you unpack it, there is a release of over 5,000 prisoners. And people might think this is such a long distance from home. What does it matter to us? But it matters for two particular reasons. Security in Afghanistan impacts us here. Um, Afghanistan is the largest producer of opium, and most of that opium is produced in Taliban-held territory. And Taliban has got links to al-Qaeda, to Daesh and al-Nusra Front, and all these Islamist ideologies do have an impact on how young people are groomed in the UK to become extremists as well. Do you think the US might have been a bit, not exactly duped, but 
wooed by the idea of signing this peace deal without actually looking at what might have been compromised? They've spent nearly two decades in the country. I, I assume that they wanted to, to, to leave and, you know, put some of the, the pressure back on um, the Afghans themselves to deliver peace in the area. But it's not as smooth as what I'm reading in the papers, that having a peace deal with the Taliban is a peace deal with the Afghan people or the Afghan government. And what do you think the UK government should do? I they think we need, need to warn? Well, we, warn? Need to, we need to still continue to play incredible close attention to the country and the region. It isn't over yet at all. And my experience of working in Afghanistan and working with Afghan parliamentarians in particular, we have had to, well, the Afghan women have had to move mountains to be recognised as equal citizens in some areas in Afghanistan. And the prospect that this could all go back to square one, where women were flogged in public or even executed, um, even for, you know, flogged for showing an, an inch of skin if they weren't wearing the full veil, the niqab, they weren't allowed to go to school and participate outside of home. We cannot go back to um, a system where they are treated so abhorrently. And that, you everything. think that might happen? Well, the, the Afghan women are concerned and I'm concerned for them as well. There was, a, there was a, uh, an Afghan parliamentarian who was involved in the negotiations and she had wanted to be a doctor in earlier life but wasn't allowed to go to school and when she became a, a parliamentarian the Taliban um, you know tried to um, attack her on a number of occasions so mm -hmm. I have a huge anxiety to to try and believe that the uh, a peace deal with the Taliban will deliver any sort of peace for Afghan women. Um, you will always be the first ever uh, Muslim woman to serve uh, as a minister how concerned are you about the inquiry into Islamophobia in the Conservative Party? I am the, to see it happen. I'm the first um, female Muslim MP to to speak at the dispatch box, and that happened back in 2018, um, which was also the year that we celebrate celebrated the centenary of women getting the vote. So it was sort of poignant. Um, I, you know, we uh, we the the inquiry. Are you yes? Well, I've I've got full confidence that the Prime Minister and the new chairman will continue to undertake this inquiry. I had a meeting with Number 10 just a few weeks ago to say, look, we need to crack on with this and get it done. When is it going to happen, then? I don't have those details at hand. I'm not uh, responsible for the inquiry. Sure, but it's quite simple to set it up, though, isn't it? Well, the inquiry has to take into account processes and cases that are brought forward. I want to make sure the inquiry is done, that the conclusions are out there, that when people fall below the threshold that what we accept is acceptable and all forms of racism and abuse, that they're dealt with quickly and then removed as well. OK, thank you very much for coming on the show, uh, Nuzgani, uh, speaking you. there. Thank you.